I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Okay, everybody. Ronnie here from The Truth About Addiction. Um, thanks for joining us on another episode. We've got Phil Paikia here today. Phil's a um, proud New Zealand man who's been around the traps. I'm sure he'll tell you his story. And uh, I met Phil in New Zealand. He's doing really good stuff over there. And I approached him and said, mate, could you please come on my podcast? You know, I celebrated 37 years clean last Friday. And, you know, I haven't taken a drug for 37 years. And drugs were a bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a problem. They put me in prison for about 17 years. So I had a small problem with them. And uh, let Phil tell his story. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, hey, good morning. Uh, morning, brother. Good morning, Australia. Uh, good morning to my son who lives on the Gold Coast. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, my name is uh, Phil Pakia, and uh, I, I live in New Zealand, and I live in a uh, small community called Ruakaka Beach. So I'm only spinning distance from the water. Uh, I've lived in this area now for going on 38 years, I guess, and it was uh, in this community that. Um, I, I had my epith- uh, my epiphany, uh, had my wake up call. Um, I was born in a little place called Helensburg, little country town in New Zealand, uh, back in 1958. I'm uh, 65 now. Um, yeah, I uh, was brought up in an era where respect was, um, you know, was paramount, and that we uh, listened to our elders and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm of Maori descent and Irish descent, so I'm uh, my tribal people are called uh, Ngati Fatua. Uh, my uh, my uh, hapu is uh, Te Uri O Ho, and on my Irish side, I'm from County Cork. <laughs> uh, top of the morning to you. Yeah, top of the morning to you. Yeah, and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, like I met Rod uh, over in uh, New Zealand. Uh, uh, three, three, four weeks ago, we came over to a gang who we had uh, in South Auckland uh, to talk about abuse and state care, um, and that happened. That happened a lot. Uh, I had a friend of mine die in uh, die in a mental health institute that electrocuted him. That's back in the day when uh, you played up. You got electric shocks, electric shocks in those places, and unfortunately, uh, they murdered my uh, a good friend of mine. And uh, yeah, so those, those those things happened back in the day. Anyway, um, back to my uh, upbringing. Uh, my father was a uh, hardworking man, uh, as was my mum. My mum worked on the market gardens, and you know we weren't a rich family at all. Uh, we didn't even have a TV. Mm. You know, we just had the bare bare essentials. And uh, when we did get a TV, it was a black and white one. Mm. But before TV, we all sat and listened to a radio. Um, that was back in the day. So, uh, yeah, I, our parents loved us when we were kids, but uh, as we grew a bit older, uh, the old men uh, would go to the pub, and we were brought up in a time when there was 6 o'clock closing. Pubs closed at 6 o'clock. Yeah. Most of yeah. our dads knocked off work at 5. Yeah. So when they went to the pub, they had X amount of uh, minutes to, um, you know, to uh, uh, consume alcohol within before 6 o'clock. And it was there that my father sort of uh, preloaded and went to a mate's place and came home drunk. And, uh, yeah, our, our mum, being part of Irish, always stood up to our father. And she paid the price. You know, he used to, yeah, he used to um, physically abuse our mother. And that was a scary time for us kids, you know. Uh, when our dad was in that state, we, we instinctively rang to our room. My uh, my older brother, my my little sister... And myself, jump on the bed, grab a blanket and pull it over our heads. And we used to say to each other, gee, we hope mum doesn't say anything to dad. Mum just keeps quiet. Dad won't hurt her. But our mother, she didn't like our father coming home that state. So we saw all that stuff. Uh, we also, my brother, older brother and I also bore the brunt of our dad's anger uh, when he gave us uh, a hiding. You know, when I mean a hiding, you know, a lot of my non-Maori mates, um, Kiwi mates that I went to school with, you know, they got what they call a, um, a, 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 a pat on the backside or a wooden spoon mm-hmm. or a gentle. And I wish, I wish that was us, but it wasn't us. 
we got the Hoover hose and the kettle cord slap marks on our bodies and you know, we got sent to school like that. Mm-hmm. But hey, you know, back in those days it was normal. For a lot of us it was normal. And uh, yeah. It was uh, quite uh, it was quite uh, embarrassing going to school with marks on the back of your legs and stuff on your body. You know, uh, people looking at you and teasing you, stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, uh, having said that, regardless of what our father did and our mum, you know, uh, we still loved him. You know, we still loved him. Because uh, we thought that when we got a hiding, it was our fault. Uh, we shouldn't have played up or made this mistake or made that mistake. Yeah, but um, it sort of... Um, set the scene for my antisocial behavior, to be honest. Um, I ran away from home at the age of 16, going on 16. Um, disappeared uh, uh, disappeared into a, a job uh, uh, at the New Zealand Forest Service and uh, got introduced to alcohol and drugs because I stayed in a single men's quarters. Stayed with all the young fellas, all the uh, older men or older young, young fellas than me. And uh, got given a job there got given a little hut just out of a bed and a, and a table attached to the wall, chair, a little little fridge and a stove. And uh, that was my uh, that was my lodgings. I got given a, an account at the local store. So whenever I needed stores and stuff like that, I could go and book it up. And I got paid um, $220 a fortnight uh, for wages. And that was a crap load of money for us young fellows back in those days. It's amazing what you could buy with 50 cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, so he, I was on the road to independence, and I loved it because I was no longer getting bashed for my dad. And, um, yeah, I, like I got introduced to alcohol. Uh, alcohol was foreign to me to touch. Our, our old man told us three things. Don't drink alcohol, don't smoke cigarettes, and don't get your girlfriend pregnant. Those three things. Well... I did all those three things then, so. <laughs> yeah, because um, he could no longer touch me. I was, I had my independence, and I loved it. I loved it. Uh, I got shown a trade. Uh, I was training to be a woodsman in the forest service. Yeah, then I, of course, like I said, I got introduced to alcohol. I didn't do it very well. You know, two bottles, and I was off my face because it was foreign to me. And then I got given a, a past the joint. I had a couple of puffs of that, and then man, I had a countdown on that too. So I didn't like it. It made me feel funny. And didn't like it. I didn't touch it for a long, long time. But alcohol became my go, my go-to stuff. Anyway, I left the forest service after a couple of years or a year or so. And then I moved down to Auckland City, and it was there that I saw for the first time yeah. walking up uh, K Road, we call K Road in Queen Street, uh, my first time seeing Maori and Pacifica dressed in drag. With painted lips and um, big blonde wigs, wearing high heel shoes with all black thighs, and um, yeah, that was that was foreign to us. We never saw that stuff in our country. Yeah, you know? and uh, then I got a job uh, as a spot welder at New Zealand Motor Corporation uh, in New Zealand there, and and I, I learned to trade. And uh, back in the back in the seventies, uh, you didn't have to have qualifications to get a job if you were keen to work. There were men in those industries that will show you a trade, mm. and um, you know, if, and uh, and they did. My wages tripled, and I stayed with an uncle and auntie uh, in uh, in Auckland City. Um, they said you can come and live with us, and if you just get yourself a job. So I got myself a job, and then I settled into city life. Um, <clears throat> did a lot of nightclubs over there. I dressed well, dressed up in pinstripe suits and Panama hats, uh, big platform shoes mm. back in the day. Yeah, and then I got introduced to drugs there and uh, Buddha sticks actually, or Thai sticks. Yeah. But the stuff that we smoked was laced with opium and cocaine. And uh, so you'd only need a, uh, you know, a small, a small doobie to uh, to get you into that place. Uh, about three or four years uh, sharing a doobie and uh, got you quickly into that space. And uh, I actually fell in love with the drug. Made me feel good. Mm-hmm. Made me feel good. And um, as I was going to work, I'd have a smoke before I go to work, and then I have a smoke at smoker time. Yeah, and then my my work uh, quality of my work started to slip, and the local uh, our quality controller on the assembly line could see that 
was happening, and I got the sack after three warnings. So I found myself out on the street, and yeah, nowhere to go. I kicked out of my uncle and auntie's place because I lost my job. And I didn't blame them because, you know, I, it was only because of the choices I was making. So I was really well and truly on my way, you know, in the drug world. And, yeah, things started to escalate, uh, you know, uh, from uh, marijuana to pills and all that sort of stuff. So I started hanging out with uh, prostitutes and transvestites. I uh, was homeless for a few weeks and uh, lived in, um, you know, I slept in cubicles in the local uh, bus station, uh, washed there and dried myself with the, with the hand blower and you just turn the turn the funnel around and it'll just blow your hair and you up around your arm and stuff like that. But I soon got weary of, the, you know, sleeping rough and stuff like that. So I... I moved away from the city and I went down to a place called Tim's Coromandel and I started hanging out with uh, with a bunch of hippies and that suited me fine too. Uh, they weren't violent fellas. They loved drugs and at, the, at, the, at that time, drugs was my, my go-to yeah. peaceful place. Yeah, yeah so I, um, you know, uh, hung out with them for a while, dressed like them, you know, uh, sit around. You know, smoking drugs, listening to Dark Side of the Spoon, Pink Floyd. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I uh, had my first assault charge. I assaulted some guy outside of Burger Bar. And no particular reason. I was just being an asshole. Mm. It was just, no, it was no, for no particular reason. Then uh, I decided to move away from there and I moved down to Christchurch. <clears throat> and um, I went down to hook up with my brother, who was a part of a... Uh, Exodus of young Māori and Pacifica men uh, that you, that took up a trade through the trade Māori Affairs trade training scheme uh, back in the 1970s, 74, 75. And uh, um, yeah, when I got when I, when I got down to Christchurch, uh, it was there that um, I got introduced to gangs, uh, the Mongrel Mob in particular. And my brother was a member of the Mongrel Mob, and uh, I wasn't into gangs at all. Man. I was just into uh, dressing well, smelling nice, looking nice, smoking drugs. Mm. And although I was given a patch award for a brief, brief time and uh, didn't wear it again, uh, but then my go to uh, place was uh, drugs. Then I got introduced to heroin. And uh, heroin took me to a dark space. Mm. And I'd seen some real dark stuff happen in the heroin world. And uh, I OD'd. Uh, in 1977, I'm lucky to be alive today, really, and I'm thankful that uh, the mates that I were with, they saw what was happening with me, and uh, they, they cared for me and got help for me, and I decided to uh, move away from Christchurch. I had to remove myself from that environment to heal myself. Yeah, and so 77, I remember it well, it was the year that Elvis passed away, August 77. And uh, the jukeboxes are getting blasted with Elvis songs and stuff like that. Grown woman crying in the street, all that sort of stuff. Then I moved north to Whangare, which is um, uh, up in the North Island, because I was, Christchurch is down the South Island. So I moved between two islands, went back to the North Island, and I hooked up with um, cousins who were hunter-gatherers. Did a lot of fishing, hunting, diving, all that sort of stuff, but uh, they drank a lot of alcohol. I smoked a lot of drugs, and I fitted right into that. And then uh, joined up with another gang, became one of the founding members of the Black Power. Now, you mentioned the word Black Power. Everyone thinks you're a racist. <laughs> we weren't racist. We even had we even had non, non-Maori in there, and some of the Parkers that were in the group with us were stauncher than some of the Maori. Mm. So we weren't racist. It was just... Uh, a terminology we got from, uh, you know, the the Black Panthers and yep. and, and the first uh, stood for uh, was for freedom, you know, uh, in uh, in some of the prisons or especially uh, Paremoira or prison maximum maximum security prison they had two fists like that chained with uh, chained up, uh, but uh, when the chain was broken, so it was cool. Yeah, that's the bugger. <laughs> Just like that. That's my company. Yeah. Yeah, and it was called Parry Comrades. Yeah, so uh, that, that's what the first represented. And because I'm part Irish, two part Māori, man, I was never a racist. You know, um, 
I did, I, I did, however, become um, a bit of an activist against colonisation and uh, what it meant uh, for us Māori, you know, in terms of the Treaty of Waitangi, those sorts of things. I went up to celebrate Waitangi Day every February 6th, um, not to celebrate the, the moment, actually, just to throw stones at the police. <laughs> um, just you know, just all that sort of stuff. But then, uh, as I grew a bit older, I, and uh, you know, got away from the drug scene and stuff like that, you know, I started to see things from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, then I met this woman, who I'm married to now. We've been together 44 years, mm-hmm. still in love. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my life changed. Um, I mm-hmm. became a Christian. I well, you even hesitate to use that word Christian, but, <clears throat> you know, um, I, I'm a follower of the Nazarene, uh, the Hebrew that was born in Jerusalem, and his father was a, his father was a carpenter. Yeah. And, uh, but his true father was uh, the, uh, the God Almighty. So, um, so that's where I'm in. That's the space that I'm in now. Um, I work for this uh, organization here called Safe Man, Safe Family. Um, started by our, our po, our, our leader, uh, Vic Tamati, who's Samoan. Uh, Vic was, um, uh, you know, uh, was sort of connected to the King Cobras. Uh, he knew you know, a lot of his family, uh, are Sam, uh, well, he, obviously Samoan, and most of the King Cobras were Pacifica men. Um, Vic started his journey many years ago, and, um, he was hired by the, um, not a K campaign, Ministry of Social Development, to go around New Zealand talking about change and what it meant to be a change man who was once a violent man, a perpetrator of family violence. And uh, I was hired to support Beck. I was hired for six months to do the job, and uh, they kept me on for another seven years. Mm. So we travelled the countryside talking about our change, talking about our redemption journey. You know, it was. I'm not not here to uh, convert anyone to to my beliefs or my faith. So uh, uh, at the moment, I, uh, uh, I I run men's programs where I live uh, in my local community, and also further afield. I go into prisons. Um, I go into universities, talk to universities. Uh, I have no qualifications whatsoever. Mm. None. The only qualification I have, or two qualifications I have, is a marriage certificate that says I'm legally married to the, to the woman I sleep with, and a driver's license that allows me to drive my car. Yeah. Those are the only two qualifications I have. But in terms of uh, my lived experience, uh, when I signed my emails, I put QBE beside my name. Now, my, uh, my work colleague, Vic, has got the QSM, he got the Queen Service Medal. I think it was Queen Service Medal for his uh, work around family violence. So he had those honours. He had to go to go to official ceremonies and stuff like that. But I had my QB, which is called Qualified by Experience. Yes. So, um, yeah, I, you know, better that I have that than my o, my uh, uh, OBE. Yes. Which means other yeah. bo- other focus efforts. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, so that brings me to the work that I do today. Uh, you know, I love the work that I do. I love uh, empowering other men. Uh, all of us were perpetrators of family violence, but also most of us were victims. Yeah. Most of us were victims of uh, of abuse. And so, um, you know, I have a beautiful family now. You know, like my wife, she's five years younger than I am. Uh, she's 60, I'm 65. And I've been with her since she was 17. Yeah. Just turned 17. Um, I was a hard man to I bashed her, smashed her, trashed her, crashed her. You know, that was the attitude then. And it um, was my way or the highway. But through all that, she, she stood by me, you know, and I honor her for that. I didn't know the value of her. I didn't know her value. I didn't know her worth. All I cared about was the gang, the alcohol, the drugs, and everything that went with it. You know, I had a lot of... Um, I've had a lot of women in, on my journey. Um, I didn't love, I don't think I, I didn't love any of them. Uh, maybe my first one, uh, when, when I was only young, 
but you know that was just young love. Uh, but the one that I married, uh, I, I know what true love is, mm. and so now I know her worth and I know her value. Um, I had six daughters. Uh, one's a senior nurse at Middlemore Hospital. One's a social worker in Christchurch. One's a hairdresser, and others that uh, work in the New Zealand oil refinery. Yeah, so uh, my family are well established. Um, um, totally reconciled and restored my family through the changes that I made. One thing I noticed also that that um, that men uh, can create an atmosphere of fear in the home, uh, whether it's good or whether it's bad. My father, when he came home from work, he created an atmosphere of fear that made us run to our room and cover up with a blanket, hoping that he doesn't touch our mother. And but when he did touch her and he left and disappeared for three days, we were the ones that had to tend to our mum, console her, try and be her counsellor, all those sorts of things. So our go-to person was our mother, not our dad. And really the missing link to a lot of dysfunctional families, a lot of dysfunctional young men, is absent fathers. Uh, we had a father that was physically, physically present, but emotionally absent. You know, uh, we never heard, never had many hugs from our dad. Uh, never said he loved us. You know, all the sorts of things that matter. Was, um, you know, it, it, sometimes it came from my mum, but not all the time. Mm. So um, we just had to deal with stuff on our own. Back in those days, we never had the resources they have today, like counsellors, um, no three strikes, you're out sort of stuff. We never had any of that stuff. Man, you got into trouble. Get a number number one haircut straight to Boston. Yeah. And the only yeah. the only counsel we ever had was your bunk mate talk, showing us each other our scars and you know telling war stories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was a journey. I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm lucky I survived uh, the heroin. I'm lucky. I'm really lucky. A lot of a lot of my friends are not here anymore because of it. And uh, because I removed myself from that environment, uh, change had to happen. Uh, suffice it to say that when I came back north, I got straight back into the gang stuff well, in a big way by, um, through the chapter that we started. And, uh, and it was in that chaos and mayhem that I met my partner, whose family were in a rival gang. And so when we had family get togethers, it got a bit complicated. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, uh, she was a good woman. I, uh, she, she didn't have to change anything about her. She was just a, just a nice person, and uh, and I I'm the one that really corrupted her, got her full into the drugs, full into the alcohol, totally interrupted her, uh, but she knew how to stand her ground. Uh, she's a typical Maori wahine, you know, and shorter, really really short, uh, but um, you know, but um, tall in stature uh, in terms of uh, her her courage to stand up to me, even when I bashed her. She still stood up to me. Yeah, and uh, so both of us are on this journey together. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I know I know true love now, brother, and I know what it's like to be liberated from addiction, yeah. uh, the gang life, and from violence, and know what true love is when you have your grandchildren. Um, whenever they see you walking up their driveway, they come running out and say, Papa, Papa, <coughs> you know, and it, that's that's the drug for me. Yeah. You know, that's the drug for me, you know, just uh, uh, the affirmation of love from my grandchildren, the affirmation of love from my children and my and my son-in-laws. I love my son-in-laws. They're yeah. all good men. None of them are gangster, that are, but a lot of them are gang, uh, gang um, you know, uh, have uh, gang families, uh, friends and stuff like that, but have never been gang members themselves. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me and my brother. Yeah, that's beautiful, Phil. Mate, so much, you know, I relate to so much, you know, when I'd hear my father's car pull in the driveway, I wouldn't know if it was going to be the good guy or the bad guy. And I'd just put myself, you know, if he'd won at the races, everything was happy. If he'd lost at the races, shut up, you can't. You know, you couldn't make a noise in the house, you know, and he was a big man too, my dad. He was an ex-light um, heavyweight champion boxer of Australia. And my mum was five foot, four foot eleven. My mum, and he used to bash her like you bash a man, break her ribs, break her jaw, break her nose. 
And sometimes she couldn't go out the house. I'd have to get in and buy the milk because she couldn't go to the shop because her nose was broken or something like that, you know. And it was just, and and that you know, it, it really does f- fuck us up, you know. It makes it got to a point with me as a young fella. I was taught if they act like a man, you treat them like a man. Give them a backhander, you know. Slap the bitch. When you come home, if she hasn't got the fucking dinner ready, you slap the bitch, you know. So that was my upbringing. So in my early relationships, the women were getting slapped. These days, my wife slaps me. <laughs> my wife's only five foot tall. And she says, you know, my, my wife, she's not scared of me. It's so nice to live with somebody who's not afraid of you. Yeah. My children yeah. don't see violence in my home. You know, I have a little three-year-old, a seven-year-old. I'm 68. And I've, you know, I've got a new wife and kids. And my eldest daughter's a 40, like you were saying, you know, I'm so proud. One of my daughters is a nurse. She runs a drug rehab up here, a drug, drug detox. The other one's a nanny, runs a kindergarten. Yeah. I'm a street kid. I'm a street kid who spent half his life in prisons. And, you know, I could nearly sit there and say, my name's Phil Pacquia, and I'm the Australian version, you know? And I, <laughs> I, just, I just, you know, I, I found heroin and I fucking loved it. Yeah. The reason I loved it because it made me feel whole. Yeah. I never felt whole before. I used violence, crime, sex, anything to fill the hole, something to fill the void that I had inside of me. And now I fill the void by helping other people. I believe that's the, the secret. It doesn't matter what we believe in. We have to believe in ourself. If we don't believe in ourself, we can't believe in somebody else. If we don't yeah. love ourselves, we can't love somebody else. You know, I love the I love the stuff you're doing, mate. I really do. I I'm trying to talk to David about coming over and doing some work over there with you guys. You know, and yeah. trying to help you guys over there with all this abuse shit that went down because we've already done that in Australia. Oh, okay. We've already, we've already gone through all this shit here. You know, and you guys are, you guys need some sort of redemption over there. You need some fucking somebody to be responsible and somebody to put their hand up and make amends for this shit, you know what I mean? Yeah, I've got the balls rolling. The balls rolling, brother. Yeah, mate. It's fucking wrong, man. If I can help you, I'm going to come over and help anything I can because, you know, we've already been down that road. We've ran that fucking gauntlet. You know, like anything. I mean, the first time you go to prison, you're scared. The second time you go, you're going to see your friends. The third time you go, you, your radio and your TV is already in your cell waiting for you. You know, it's like everything, you know. we we just got to keep this ball rolling and start this start this road of redemption going, we make people responsible. You know, there's a lot of kids fucked up. Most of the guys that grew up to be psychopaths that I grew up with was all come through institutions of abuse. Every one of them, nearly, honestly, 80, 90% of the kids I grew up with are all dead. I'm 68. Everyone's dead. I went back to Pentridge last, last month. I got invited to Pentridge. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I was in Pentridge in 1971, charged with five attempted murders, two of them on police. So, you know, I had I, I had a few issues as a kid, you know. I, I liked guns yeah. and I liked shooting them and I didn't live in the bush. So I shot everything else that moved. If that moved, I shot the fuck, you know. <laughs> Especially if it was an enemy, you know, from another gang, you know, I just shot them. And um, yeah. so I got taken back and I went to the same cell that I got beaten up in in 1971. And the emotions were out of control. The fear I felt when I walked in, because it's closed now. Pentridge is now a museum. And I got taken through there. And as we're walking through there, I just couldn't believe I was overwhelmed with emotions. I went back to being that 17-year-old little boy walking through the fucking jail for the first time with the, with the shaved head because I just shaved my head into reception. And it was horrific, you know. And, but I think it might be healing. I think, you know, I think I'm slowly working through it. And there was a board in one of the cells with 39 photos in it of all the guys out of H Division, which was the, the solitary confinement jail. And out of the yeah. 39 photos, there's only three guys still alive, Phil. Wow. 39 photos on the wall, there's only three alive. Gee. So your percentage is not real good. Yeah, your percentage is not, you know, so we, we are miracles. And I believe in a, in a loving higher power. And he kept us here for a reason. Why did all our friends get murdered or get killed themselves or OD when he let us live? Because, mate, I question that a lot. Like, I was such a fucking horrible little bastard. Why did you leave me? Why, why am I still alive? 
I'm here to carry a message. I'm here to help people. Yeah. You know, that's what this format, this this podcast I do, we don't advertise on it. We don't get any money for it. It yeah. costs me money to do it. But I do it because it carries a message. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Same. Yeah, that's why that's I asked you. Advice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I met you, I said, mate, will you please do the podcast, you know, because your message is so strong it needs to be heard. Because there's some kid sitting somewhere going like, fuck, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah, that's pretty much how it, how it was. So even when they, uh, I did the Fallon show with Dave, um, yeah, the amount of uh, people that responded was just incredible. Yeah, man. And it, and it, um, and it you know, it triggered a lot of people. You yeah. know, and, um, and even now people are still getting in touch with me and, you know, wanting me to, you know, um, you know, to uh, stay in contact with them and stuff like that. So, you know, they say that you you can't heal what you don't reveal. And um, so I, I didn't know anything about childhood trauma. Yeah. It, it wasn't until I started cleaning myself up and uh, hanging out, you know, in, in, a, in the right environment where I could flourish. And um, and then there's, those words started popping up. Uh, and I, I remember... Uh, see, like uh, you know, my wife and I uh, have been clean. Like I've been clean for over thirty years. Yeah. No drugs, right. alcohol, or anything like that, or any sort of form of family violence. And uh, three years ago, I attended a a march against sexual violence uh, up um up in a place called Kaikohe. And uh, a lot of our, my I went there along with a lot of my uh, my my mates. Uh, we were full on into uh, supporting something like that. And uh, we did the march, and then we went back to a uh, pastor's place for for lunch. And the lady that organised it all, uh, you know, she was an expert on sexual violence. Um, she came and sat at our table, and she said, "Oh, you know, uh, I I want to thank you, gentlemen, for coming. It's nice to see men come into this space where it's only women." And then she wanted to know if she could ask a few questions, so she did. She said, yeah, that's fine. She said, now, "How many of you men?" Um, Beat your wives or your partners, then uh, because we're all you know changed men, we you know we put our hands up and ownership of it all, and, <clears> and then she said, um, and then how many of you men said those magic words uh, uh, when you came back home, and the magic words being, I'm sorry, you know, well I'm sorry just doesn't cut it, mm. you know our, our our partners want to see sorry not hear it, they used to hearing it. And it, and it means nothing to them. So we said that, yeah. And then she said, then how many of you men um, uh, made up by being intimate with your wives or partners? Yeah. And and then, well, you know, we were a bit, bit coy about putting a hand up. We put a hand up anyway. And the next thing she said to us was, who initiated it? Who initiated the intimacy? And then, had a bit of a think about that and I put her hand up. And then the next thing she said was, did she consent? And then we said, uh, well, no, well, usually you, that's what we do. Well, we, you know, we give her a hiding and come home and say sorry. Make up And sense. chuck her some chocolates on the table and, you know, and then because we've been away for three days, we expect some chum chum. And, uh, you know, a bit of intimacy and, uh, yeah, we did, we did it all the time. And then she talked to us about marital rape. And, uh, man, that really got, got us, eh? Oh. And, um, yeah, and, cause, uh, back in the day, you, you couldn't get arrested for, from forcing yourself on your wife because it's, um, it's a marriage thing. You know, they could call it a domestic, so, yeah. but now it's, um, but now it's, it's different. The laws change. You can be arrested. Or, or marital rape. Anyway, um, it gave us something to think about. So when I jumped in the car, taking my mate Sam and say, hey, bro, what do you think about that? He says, yeah, bro, I did it. Mm -hmm. I did that. And then I said, bro, I did it. I said, oh, man, I'm going to, so when I dropped my mates off, I rang up to my wife and says, hey, babe, put the billy on, don't go to bed yet. Man, I need to ask some, need to ask you a question or two. And got home, she had the billy on, made us a cup of tea, sat out on the porch, and then I got straight into it. And I said, oh, babe, I got challenged at this meeting today, and I want you to be honest with me um, when I ask you the questions. So, yeah, um, sure. 
So anyway, I said to him, I remember the times I hit you, faced you, and and uh, then said sorry, and, and then uh, then we were intimate. What did you think about that? And then she went all quiet. And then she said, I just wanted you to finish what you're doing and get the fuck off me. Wow. Now you'll never hear my you'll never hear my wife swear. Yeah, never. I met my wife. Yeah, and it was. She got triggered. She held on to that all those years mm. that I forced myself on her. And because oh. I, you know, and the dumbest thing I ever said to her, well, why would you say anything? She said, what do you expect me to say? You gave me a hiding. What do you want me to say? Mm. And then I knew then and there that my wife was holding on to that historical trauma. She held on to it. That's so powerful. Oh mate, that that was so 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 hectic too. What you're talking about it was making me feel so guilty. My brain was going back through my old relationships. It was like, wow, this is yeah. so. And it's true. Yeah. It's so, man. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. I got some so, to make. <laughs> so you know, so when that, uh, so both of us cried, brother. Um, you know, I I, I really had to and. I apologized to her, and, and this time I meant it. Yeah. I, I said sorry, and you know, you know, brother, now I don't initiate intimacy with my wife. Well, you know, uh, us men are ready to do it any time of the day, you know, in the yeah. car, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, <laughs> in the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> but women are different, brother. You know, uh, you know, I gotta, you know, I date my wife, and you know, and, uh, you know, uh, you just gotta, you know, create an atmosphere where it's safe and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> but now I, I wait for her. I tell you what, brother. Uh, you know, if you go into the big games to a stadium uh, with all the fireworks going off and stuff like that, when Mum she's ready to be intimate, that's yeah. what it's like. Yeah, when she, you know, when she's ready. Yeah, yeah. You know, buckle up, yeah. buckle yeah. up. When Mum she's ready to be intimate, yeah. brother. Exactly, exactly, mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's like the races when the flag gets dropped, mate. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mate, look, you're a gentleman, Phil. You really are, mate. You know, you it's funny, I I've you know, I, I get around a fair bit, I travel the world, I do a lot of shit, you know. And I was still mate, you know, I've only been I've been clean a long time, but I've only stopped crime 20 years ago. I was still a criminal when I was clean, and but that's what I was, you know. I don't, you know, I don't apologize and I don't boast about it. Yeah, you know, that's what I was. You know, I was born a criminal. My father was a gangster. If my dad had been a lawyer, I probably would have been a lawyer. Yeah. I'm going to say this. Even when I say it, I feel sick. If he had been a cop, I might have been a cop. <laughs> you know what I mean? But even when I say it, I don't believe it. You know? <laughs> but, you know, I am a product of my upbringing. Yeah. You know? And that's why I've had to break that cycle. You know, I say I've got a daughter who's 16 years clean of cocaine. Yeah. And I say... Addiction used to run into our family till it ran into me. You know, and it was my job to change. My old man was a piece of shit. And it was my job to change that. My dad was super violent towards my mother. It was my job to change that. My father was sexually abusive towards my family. I had to change that. So I have a big responsibility to do, but I also have a responsibility to, to pass it on, to carry that message forward and to teach other men that's not gangster. Yeah. You want to be gangster? Put food on the table for your wife and children. I walk in my house. As soon as my car pulls up, my little three-year-old girl runs. Dad! And her yeah. and her seven-year-old brother race to cuddle me. Yeah. yeah. You know, they have fights yeah. over three-way kisses. They both got to kiss me at the same time. <laughs> I never That's heard gangster. my father say, I love you to anybody in my whole life. Yeah. I never seen my father kiss my mother. I heard him fucking her. Yeah. And I heard her crying. Yeah. And I heard him beating her. Yeah. I remember I ran in there when he was when I was 14 years of age. My father was beating my mother. And I ran into the bedroom and said, Don't hit my mother. And he turned on me and he, he split my head open where he kicked he was kicking me. I'm I'm 14 years of age. He knocked me to the ground. He's an ex-heavyweight champion fighter. Knocked me to the ground, he's kicking me. So he split on me with his dirty toenails, cut on my head open. Then he got up and walked out and he said, fucking clean that cunt up. And he left. And I said to my mum, just may God strike me dead. 
when he comes home, because I had guns, when he comes home, I'm going to blow his head off. You tell the cops he was beating you and I saved you. You know what my mother said to me, Phil? She didn't say, oh, you don't kill your father. She said, he's not worth going to jail for. That's, that was her words. He's not worth going to jail for. My mum passed away five years later. Your mum was wise. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. I still went to jail anyway for shooting somebody else, but I should have. I, you know, it's, I, I, I live with it today, but I regretted not killing him. My whole life, I regretted. I'm, I'm 68 years of age. My whole life, I regretted not killing him that day. I always had remorse that I didn't kill him. But my mum passed away five years later, and that's when I started using heroin. And then I had the 10 years of... See, I was in jail long before. I never took drugs before I shot people. I was shooting people before I took drugs. You know, I was already really messed up because my dad, my dad, first time I shot someone, I was with my father and I shot him with a shotgun in the legs and he abused me for shooting him in the legs. Ah, you weak cunt. You don't shoot him in the legs. You shoot him in the head, you know. Dead men can't tell tales. Don't fucking wound people. You wound him, you give the opportunity for him to come back. That's at 16. So... I was never gonna. Um, I was never gonna fit into society on society's terms. But I've got that. I, I stole your words, QBE. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because that's me. That's all my qualifications are. I run a really successful business. You know, helping people, and I got a QBE. Quali- that's you, brother. That's you, brother. Qualified by experience, man. You yeah. know, I tell people the truth. I don't bullshit. You know, I hate liars. Yeah. You know, the only people I lie to are the coppers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was I was, I was taught that, you know. You only lie to cops and cunts. <laughs> you know? So which one am I? My man said to me, which one am I? Am I a cop or a cunt if I lied to him, you know? You only lie to two people in this world, coppers and cunts, you know? <laughs> and today I don't lie to myself because when I was lying to myself, I was a cunt to everybody. Anybody that came near me, man, was going to be negatively harmed by being my friend. I remember kids saying to me as a little kid, my mum said, you're going to be the death of me, you know, because I was so out of control. But we thought it was normal. You thought it was normal. We grew up with that world where it was normal. To hit somebody on the head with, the, with, the, with a bar is not normal. To me, that was normal. That was normal. That wasn't like, oh, man, that's freaky. You know, that's like, okay, that's what we do. You know, you get into a, a ruckus, you use whatever weapon you can get your hands on because the whole thing is about not being harmed. And I'll tell you, this is something I found really funny, and you might relate to this. I was a tough guy, but I was really scared. And that's why I was so violent, because I had so much fear inside of me. Unfounded that's fear. Yeah, that's right, bro. Yeah. I was scared of getting beat, because if you beat me, then everyone can beat me. Yeah. If I back down, then everyone would stand over me. And then I found out that once I had faith, there was no room for fear. You can't that's have right. fear in your life when you got when you got faith. There's no room for fear. That's right. I, I use the phrase uh, 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 "fear." Fear knocked at my door. Faith opened it, and there was no one there. Yeah, I like that. That's the truth. I try to explain yeah. to people all the time. Unfounded fear yeah. is the devil's way of playing fuck with your brain. That's right. You know. So what I do is when I get an unfounded fear, I challenge it. What evidence is that true? 99.9.9% of the night time, as you said, I open the door, there's no one, no one there. Yeah. Because fears, fears in your imagination. Fears, fears in your imagination. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Man, look, look, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you coming on, Phil. You know, I know you're a busy man. I know you've got family, you know. And I do, I do respect people's time because time's the most valuable gift you can give to me. We can't yeah. make more time. Yeah, no, awesome, brother, talking with you, eh? and uh, I made another friend. Yeah, no, uh, man, no, we, we'll be doing a lot more stuff together. I, I, I see in the future you and I, you and I doing shit together, brother. I really do. Yeah, and uh, I'll be over there in a couple of months. I'll grab Dave and we'll come and visit you. Yeah, yeah, awesome, my brother. Mate, love your story, brother. Love your attitude and love what you're doing. You really, I really appreciate your time, Phil. I really do. I'm saying that sincerely. And mate, you know, look forward to our futures. We're still yeah, hey. we have plenty of time left, running young guys. Absolutely, absolutely, brother. Hey, hey, God bless you, bro. God, God bless, bless you and your God bless you and your family. Uh, 
You, you mind if we just uh, have a cut of key before we then? Yes, Do mate. You? Yeah, go. Well, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for my brother here today, Lord, and uh, I thank you for the change that he's making in his life, Father. Lord, I just pray that you reveal yourself more and more to our brother. And Lord, I know that we'll be lifting him up in prayer too in the work that he does in his community and where he resides in Australia. Lord God, everyone matters. Everyone matters to you, Father, whether they're criminals or not, whether they're rich or whether they're poor. Lord, that your, your hand is extended to everyone that would acknowledge you. Uh, I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God.